Good afternoon. And forgive me for interrupting your lunch. Please continue to enjoy the delicious food. Um, I have to give a shout out here to Paisley Benaza, who's over there in the uh, gold colored sweater. Paisley is the one that has been our point person on logistics and made sure that we had delicious things to eat during the day. I, if it was up to me, we would have just had bologna sandwiches, but uh, <laughs> Paisley said, no, we deserve better. <clears throat> um, so, good afternoon, buenas tardes, quali yo um, It is my distinct pleasure to introduce our lunch featured speaker, who is the Honorable Nelly Gorbea, Secretary of State for Rhode Island. Um, when you hear Secretary Gorbea, um, I think you're going to sit up and, and take notes, so be ready. Uh, you'll be looking and hearing from someone that is really the face of history. When she was elected as Secretary of State in 2015, she was the first Latina, the first Hispanic elected to statewide office in New England. She has rapidly emerged on the national scene as a leader, taking on some of the toughest issues and getting results, um, leading the way for other states across the country. Before being elected as Secretary of State, she was uh, leading an organization working to make housing affordable in Rhode Island. She has served as Deputary, Deputy Secretary of State and led the creation of the Rhode Island Latino Civic Fund, among many other accomplishments. She's originally from Puerto Rico as a graduate of Princeton University's Woodrow Wilson School for Public and International Affairs and holds a master's degree in public administration from Columbia, of all places. So she is quite accomplished and she's a very fun speaker. I have to tell you, when her name came up in our planning committee, everyone just basically applauded and said, how could we do better? Uh, so we're very excited to hear from Secretary Gorbea. I won't take any more time away from her so she can uh, dazzle us with, uh, with her thoughts about what we ought to be doing to support our voters. So. Please take it away. Thank you so much, Secretary Gorbea. Thank you so, thank you so much, uh, Alberto. It's um, buenas tardes, buen provecho. It's great to be all with all of you here. Bon appetit. Um, I want to thank, of course, uh, uh, Chairman uh, Tom Hicks and the EAC team, uh, Alberto and his team over at Arizona State University's Pastor Center for Politics and Public Service. And of course, my good friends at the Democracy Fund Voices uh, for putting together this really wonderfully informative uh, language access summit today, and uh, particularly to the Democracy Fund for allowing us to all eat together. <laughs> um, it's, there's something to be said, I think, in a lot of our cultures. Uh, we really do provide sort of a space for all of us to get together over food and break bread, and that this is really important. And so, um, and I was particularly impressed with your lineup, not necessarily because of your lunch speaker, but because uh, you have a really strong Rhode Island bench. Uh, and it's great to see Kathy Placencia uh, from our uh, Providence Board of Canvassers here uh, as one of your panelists. Uh, and I also want to acknowledge my Deputy Director of Elections, Norelis Consuegra, uh, under whose leadership we've been able to really expand uh, bilingual offerings here in Rhode Island um, and our civics uh, uh, materials. Uh, so I am particularly grateful for this invitation to speak with you today because the issue of language rights and access to the ballot box has been something that I've been interested in most of my life. Uh, it didn't start that way though. I mean, I grew up in Puerto Rico uh, and language access or language rights for elections on the island uh, weren't really an issue growing up. You know, when you know, Puerto Ricans are U.S. citizens who are native Spanish speakers with various levels of English fluency. And we can do fine in the elections locally where everything runs in Spanish and everybody kind of knows the system and it's once every four years and it's fairly simple. It's very uniform across the island. Uh, every municipality has the same setup. Uh, and all you really have to focus on is in the parties and what's on, on, the, on the news. Um, and so it's really our migration as Puerto Ricans to the mainland that really uh, brought to the forefront Section 203 for me. And in fact, it was my coming to college. Uh, and uh, I decided to take a course uh, in college at Princeton. It was a student-initiated seminar. And I say that because it's important that it was the students that organized uh, the syllabus along with the faculty member. And it was a course on the law and Hispanic society in the US. And that was my introduction to the Voting Rights Act. And what I remember beyond the you know, technical parts of, of 
having to learn what the law provided, um, is that our, our fight uh, for civil rights is intertwined uh, with, with, language rights is intertwined with, with civil rights. I'm sorry, I just realized that this is, is this the clicker? Okay. I'm like, oh, that's not moving. Um, so there we go. Uh, and, and it allowed me to understand how tied together language rights are to the history of desegregation in this country and how language access is rooted firmly in the struggle for civil rights. And I think that's something that's important for us to come back to because we build on each other's experiences in our struggles. And so learning about not just sort of court cases that have been won by the African-American community, but then Latinos and Asian and, uh, and Pacific Islanders, we're all interrelated. And we can all help each other as we move on this path forward. So up to that point in college, that, that kind of had been a, an academic subject for me. Um, but history became real shortly after graduation. And I moved to New Jersey. I become a resident of Trenton. Uh, and then go on to serve as an interpreter at the polls on election day. And it was really, really interesting to have to deal with people who were really committed to voting and yet had a hard time navigating through uh, the process. Uh, and so that was my sort of first real sort of personal experience with access to the ballot box through, through language. Um, fast forward a few more years and I get married. Uh, the guy who I married, who I met in college, ends up uh, as a professor at the Oceanography School at the University of Rhode Island. And so he has a job and I don't, and I moved to Rhode Island, where I really didn't know anyone uh, and uh, didn't really know much about the state. And the thing about the U.S., and I think this is also uh, really important to think about, is that anytime you move in the U.S., you need a speedy tutorial on civics. And we really don't take the time to do that. So, you know, we really have kind of like a democracy on steroids. I mean, in, in, in the state, in, uh, state of Rhode Island, if you move from Providence to one socket, you've changed the entire bottom part of your ballot. Now, who engages with you to let you know that that's the case? Who helps you have that conversation so that by the time that you do show up, you know what it is that you're expected uh, you know, what are the questions that are being asked? And so on top of the sort of mechanical difficulties of getting to the polls, uh, there is this other issue of just understanding uh, the system. And so, you know, so I moved to Rhode Island and, you know, being the policy, public policy wonk that I am, I become more involved with our state government and I find a way to get appointed to this Governor's Advisory Commission on Hispanic Affairs. This is the mid-1990s. These things were kind of popping up all over the place. It was a fairly like, reasonable um, strategy by elected officials who were mainstream to, to bring in input from the, from the community. And this is just at the same time as Motor Voter is being implemented in Rhode Island. So this opportunity came to be a part of this commission and it, it helped me figure out ways in which how can we help people understand how government works. Now, just before my time on the commission in 1992, the city of Central Falls makes history, uh, becoming the first city in our state to, become, to meet the criteria of Section 203 of the Voting Rights Act. We now have three communities uh, that meet Section 203 requirements. Um, at that time in Rhode Island, uh, we were still using what, what are called shoot lever machines. They're very bulky, they look like you know, portable closets, and uh, the ballots were huge. And so in, in 1992, it was, it was pre-digital, and the Shoop's lever machines are not really designed to handle more than one language. And so Rhode Island uh, decides to provide access through Spanish-speaking ballots on separate machines, which is less than ideal, of course. Uh, so this is what, I brought a picture of what these look like. This is a, in Spanish. The first thing I looked at when I, when I saw this, by the way, and you, some of you in the back can't tell, but um, the, 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 there's a typo actually on this ballot under offices. It's, it says oficiales instead of oficia, oficiales. Um, and I just 
or excuse me, typos are the bane of any election person. Um, so, so you had these separate ballots, uh, which made it easy to find out which language group had voted for which candidates, which is not ideal. Now that system changed in the mid-1990s with the arrival of new paper ballot scanning voting machines. And this new technology gave us uh, a better way to do this. We can now put the, the language right next to each other, one after the other, and there was only one ballot, uh, which, which gave uh, more anonymity uh, to the vote. So, this in, so fast forward a little bit more, and in 2002, I'm appointed Deputy Secretary of State at the same time as Providence, our capital city, crosses the 203 threshold. And so here you'll see the three communities. The red is Central Falls. Um, the blue is Providence. And then 10 years later, after Providence, it seems like we, we grow in tens, uh, Pawtucket, uh, Rhode Island, becomes the third community. Uh, and so, on a national level in 2002, you know, the Help America Vote Act had passed, funds are being granted to the states to improve elections, and in, as a Deputy Secretary of State, I'm in this amazing position overseeing elections, part of the elections, and actually uh, working for the Chief State Election Official of the state to meet the needs of the rising Spanish-speaking uh, Hispanic uh, community in, in the state. So. Um, we, we go on to really redevelop our website. We provide a lot more language materials uh, in, in Spanish. And we go about doing something I think is just as important as providing the, the access to the materials, which is to have people in your office that can actually speak the language. And so we try to grow that capacity in the office uh, as much as possible. Uh, we, we hire, uh, you know, bilingual employees. In fact, Kathy was actually one of our first hires uh, in our office way back when. And, and so that helps kind of, once you have the employees in the civil servant ranks, then that, the provision of, of bilingual, of accurate bilingual materials becomes a lot easier. You can, as somebody said, just do the special project when it's too, the legalese just, you know, it's too much. So after my time as Deputy Secretary of State, I begin, become, I go back to working in the community. And in 2014, I run for Secretary of State. And as was said, Rhode Island makes history in New England, uh, electing the first Hispanic to statewide office. Um, and someone who uh, comes to this with a real passion for making sure that people understand the system. Um, over the last three and a half years, uh, we've been working even harder to make uh, language access, not just, not just provide language access by translating, but actually doing the civics education that people need to understand what it is that they're voting for. And so we began looking at this sort of deeper communication uh, with with two things in mind. One is plain English, because you've got to start with plain English. And then designing things in a way that are accessible and approachable. So we began with a ballot, and we worked with experts at the Center for Civic Design, the Election Assistance Commission, the American Institute of Graphic Arts, and the Brennan Center for Justice. And we also had a lot of input from organizations like the Disability Law Center. Sorry, that's a graph. And so this is harder to, you'll, later on when you have a closer look up to these, you can, you can see. This is our previous ballot. It had the arrows. Some, some of the arrows, it's hard to see which column are you actually voting for. Um, and we go to the bubbles. And that was because we had purchased new voting machines and took advantage of that change in technology to make sure that we made it more, even more accessible. And I'll tell you a funny story. Um, Historically, referenda questions in Rhode Island had been all done in caps and bolded. And so we had bought these new voting machines that had all these new layout uh, capabilities. And I say, why, why are we all doing this all in caps? 
Can't we just do on you know different font sizes? Somehow to make it distinguishable that it's the, the referenda question. It's like, oh, yeah, we can. So we go ahead and we redesign the ballots with much friendlier looking referenda questions because the fonts have been changed. And I did get one community to actually push back on that and say, no, no, they have to be all in caps. I said, no, they don't. There's nothing in the law. And nobody wants to be screamed at, which is literally what it means now to do everything on, on, on caps. So, you know, just one of those things that as technology changes, we need to take that step back and say, okay, what else can we do with it? That doesn't necessarily require a legal mandate or even a rule or reg. So, so we do these um, different, and then, and then the other thing that we do is we take a look at the language that we're using for things like the voter information handbook and simplify it as much as possible. Now, we provide the legalese because that's mandated in the law. But if you can't read the voter information uh, handbook and understand what it is that the question is asking you to do, then you're basically telling that voter, you, you shouldn't even vote because you're not understanding the questions. Why are you gonna take time out of your life to go and do something that you just don't real, really feel comfortable with? And so I made it a priority to redesign the voter handbook and to provide plain English and plain Spanish information about what it is that was being asked of the voter. And we did this not just because of the people in our office, but we tested it out with people in the community. And I think that's another really important lesson in Rhode Island. Um, my first involvement in language issues here in Rhode Island was being asked to look at a, a Spanish language ballot back in the Central Falls days. Is this, does this read okay? It was part of that director of elections process for making sure that since she didn't speak Spanish, it was understandable by a wide variety of people. So, so we need to do things in a way that people understand. It's about providing the opportunity for all voters to, under, to, to have that understand, understanding of how it is that they're being asked to make a difference. Now to that end, we also um, wanted to reach young people and those who are new to Rhode Island. Uh, and by new, I don't mean necessarily, you know, they could be from Georgia or they could be from California uh, or they could be from another country. And so we began, began incorporating some civic education tools for people to use. And again, I apologize because these are really small on these screens. But this is uh, a, 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 our levels of government uh, infographic that depicts five major policy areas, education, the environment, public safety, the economy, and transportation. And within those, it gives examples of specific issues such as expand recycling, taxes, laws about guns. And we show how the different levels of government, whether you're state, local, or federal, interact with that particular issue. So that we bring across the point that, despite what you hear in the media, that only the national election counts, there's a lot of things that are being decided at your local level, at your state level. And you give people the tools with which to think about oh, I really want to fi figure out who I'm going to vote for at the local level. We also, uh, uh, so we incorporated these kinds of infographics as part of our Why Be a Voter, uh, part of our Voter Information Center. And in addition to this one, we, we explained how the election system is actually set up in Rhode Island. Because if you, move, God forbid, move from Massachusetts uh, I mean, from Rhode Island to Massachusetts, it's a whole other different ballpark. So you need to explain to people in very simple ways, respectful ways, how it is that our, in, the, in our case, elections are run by the Secretary of State, the Board of Elections, and local boards of canvassers. What is the relationship between those? Who do I call if I have a voter registration question? Who do I call if I have a question about why is this candidate not on the ballot? Uh, and so this is, is part of the civics education that we've tried to make accessible to people. Um, this is another infographic on how to participate. How do you participate in this democracy? Or how does a bill become a law? 
how is your municipal government structured? And finally, branches of government uh, and the federal, uh, at, the, at the federal and state level. This is on our voter information page. It is hugely important. Um, the lack of civics education in this country, I think, has had a really negative effect on the health of our democracy. And so it is incumbent upon those of us in these positions to not just provide the bare minimum of somebody said in terms of languages or information, but to go beyond that to really inform voters as to how our system works. Now, our, more, uh, our newest uh, mode of, of communicating uh, is, because um, we're trying to keep up with everybody, is uh, an Instagram account called RI Votes, and I'm gonna end with that particular, this is one of the memes, if you want laughs, and if you start looking at them now, you're gonna start laughing, so we'll know that you're looking at it. Um, the, this meme was created by one of our, Zo our summer interns, Zoe, and it's part of our non-traditional methods to encourage young voters under 25 to register and vote. Uh, the, the Instagram account, again, is RI Votes. We also created a, a website called rivotes.org uh, that actually kind of does a lot of short videos, peer-to-peer -peer videos on why it matters. Um, you know, as I, and I thought about these remarks today, uh, it seems surreal how much, really, when you think about it, a small section, like Section 203, in a much bigger law, the Voting Rights Act, uh, can be so important uh, in people's lives and how they interact with their government. I know that the efforts of many of you here in this room uh, have had an important effect in improving our democracy. And I know it because I've lived it. And just as my story with language access has evolved, so does our ability to innovate and improve language access in our elections. And if there's anything that I wish to encourage you to do as a follow-up to being here today is to, first and foremost, simplify your English so that translations are made easier. By the way, I want to give a shout-out to the people interpreting into Spanish. They're doing a phenomenal job, and that's a tough job. Uh, and two, engage those in your language minority communities in helping you address these issues for their own communities. Not only will it build a stronger capacity in those communities that you want to engage, it gives them the, the, the vehicles with which to engage in their government and make our democracy stronger. And who knows, maybe one day, thanks to you and those who fought for and crafted Section 203, one of those community activists that you work with can even become Secretary of State or even higher. And so with that, I thank you and uh, have a great rest of your summit. I think I have a few more minutes if ca in case people want questions or, or have observations. Thanks. Hello, um, my name is Mike Moser from the Pennsylvania Department of State. Um, thank you for being here. Um, and I absolutely love that you're hitting the point of plain language as a base to hone in uh, the usability and the understanding of the content. And so I was just really curious if you could speak more to the organizational and cultural change within uh, the government to make that happen, because it's a topic we're really interested in Pennsylvania, so I'm just curious how that how you're able to transform in that direction. Well, like all transformations, it starts at the top, and I know that your secretary is an awesome uh, leader, uh, and you've been led by some really great uh, secretaries. I have to personally know uh, both of the current and the former Secretary of State of Pennsylvania. Um, there are no shortcuts. I mean, you just, you have to drill down the message, and then you have to go at it over and over and over again. Um, you know, I, maybe because I come from a community that has access issues, I, I think about that a lot. And so when I see something, I'm always thinking about how can we make it simpler? How can we make it simpler? 
Uh, and, and in turn, that will make it easier to be translated. I don't care what language you're translating into. Having a simple form of whatever it is that you're trying to communicate makes it a lot easier. Uh, so we go through a lot of drafts, a lot of uh, sort of going back and forth, and we have a fairly large review process uh, so that you know, whoever's writing has several layers of review that they have to go through including to people who have nothing to do with elections. In fact, most importantly, to people who have nothing to do with elections. So our staff in business services will read something, um, our staff in the archives, um, people who are part of community groups that we know that we can ask them for a quick turnaround. Uh, and so it's about engagement. It, you have to build a, the time in for that kind of review until you've translated the bulk of the of the, or rewritten of the bulk of the information into as simple as possible. Um, so that, that's my advice on that. I mean, I, I'll give you sort of what, part of what my impetus on this, I remember, and I, I love public policy, right? I'm a total public policy wonk. And I remember reading a voter information handbook several cycles back and going, I don't understand what it means to approve or reject this question. Now, I have a master's degree in public administration, and I love this stuff. If I'm not understanding what this means, what hope does somebody who honestly has a lot of other things on their plate and maybe not as interested? And so you're, you're dissuading people from participating in the democracy by making it very complicated. And you're basically telling them, your vote really doesn't matter. Same, uh, same voter information forms. Like we redesigned the voter information, I mean, the voter registration form because it was hostile looking. There's no reason a government form has to look hostile. Like, and you all know what I'm, I'm talking about. So clean it up. I mean, it's something that the private for profit sector does all the time. They make it pretty, they make it nice, they make it easy for you to just, you don't even have to read it. It just jumps out you what it is that you're trying to communicate. That should be the standard for government as well, because we want to hear from you. Hi, Jim Tucker on behalf of the Native American Rights Fund. Uh, thank you so much for speaking. Uh, I have a question related to what you just covered. I think it's fascinating. So the Election Assistance Commission has been really good at serving as a clearinghouse. It seems to me one of the areas that we're falling short is where the states that are great innovators, where you have these great ideas, are not necessarily getting the word out to uh, you know, other state election administrators who can kind of follow in your footsteps. And I was wondering if you could perhaps talk about ways in which perhaps other organizations such as the National Association of Secretaries of State can help fill that void and really try to improve elections nationwide from, based on your example in Rhode Island. So, so, so actually, I'll, 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 I'll do take a point of, of contention with your, the premise of your question. I do think that, that organizations like the National Association of Secretaries of State are trying to do best practices. This particular topic, possibly not as much. Um, and, and so... I think there is a way in which we need to kind of try to bring these in a nonpartisan way. And I think that's part of the challenge of language access, to be honest, is that too, too frequently it's, it just has this Pavlovian response um, that it generates. And, and so we need to try to lower that. And I think talking about plain English and and sort of providing access to information in a sort of accessible way is a good first step to then tackling a better understanding across the country about what we mean about language access. Why, why should we be providing information in languages other than English? I mean, if you think about Puerto Ricans, and I, I can't wait for the next panel, actually, because being Puerto Rican, I had recently read about the 203 sort of language provision on, on Puerto Ricans. Puerto Rican's first language is Spanish. Yes, we all learn some degree of English, but, uh, but we are US citizens. 
and, and, and by a historical context that's very different to other groups, we are part of the U.S. Um, should that ballot not be accessible to a U.S. citizen from Puerto Rico? Uh, so, so I think that the challenge is, is that. It's that the, the, the realm in which this issue is discussed tends to get highly politicized very quickly. And we need to somehow find ways of depoliticizing it and, and making sure that we can have these conversations. Oh, sorry. I grabbed the mic first. Um, uh, uh, Adam Ambrogi, Democracy Fund Voice. My question is one about communications. Obviously, from, from my recollection, Rhode, Rhode Island has a, at least a unique media market and probably a challenging Spanish language media uh, environment. How do, you, how do you, in that environment, reach out to the communities that you need to reach out to? And are there any messages or examples that you could use for other types of jurisdictions that may have limited uh, language access uh, media environments, maybe in rural communities or rural states? Uh, I'd love to hear how you sort of try to get over that, yep. that challenge. Yeah, no, certainly. Um, and, uh, and in Rhode Island, we recently have had the the passing, sadly, of two of, of some of the largest um, Spanish language media companies uh, in the state, and that's been uh, Latino Public Radio and, and Providence Español, both of which were critical, I would say, to providing civic information to the Spanish-speaking community in Rhode Island. Um, but we're going to have to, you know, deal in this new world, and I think Social media gives us a really good opportunity because I think Latinos overwhelmingly all have, you know, have cell phones and are somehow trying to connect through the digital world, and I think we need to look at that. Um, I also think that there is still the power of radio. And even, I mean, I've been amazed as I travel the country how many, for example, Spanish language radio stations there are in this country. And I think that engaging with those stations and making sure that you're providing some civic education through their programming, which they need to provide some sort of public uh, education type programming, um, is critical. Uh, and so those are some of the ways that, I, that we do it in Rhode Island, but Rhode Island is rather small. It is a city state. So I, I, I recognize the complexities of other states uh, and also respect the fact that you know, when you have 20 different languages in one metropolitan area, it, that can definitely be challenging. But you have to go where people are. And in order to do that, you need to have conversations with the leadership of those communities. And I think you'll find that they are going to be very welcoming and starved for that information and very willing to help you figure that out. Yes? Thank you. Thanks for your presentation. <clears throat> um, I'm so happy you have, to have such <clears throat> such a good common sense and policy work. So, I, but I want to know whether you can have a good deep sense of the real reality of our system. You see, a, a black go to campaign for some area, then they will spread the word that something is there happen. You know. It's just a sort of bad implication. So I just wonder if we have a system we can promote, just like, like you're speaking here, that we have a sort of candidate forum here, rather than somewhere else, they cannot even go there because their car sort of was stolen and taken away. It's not accessible or it's not possible to go to the, the forum. The forum itself can be discriminatory too. So I think for the purpose, for the best interest of our nation, and maybe in Long Island, if you can promote this, make the candidate possible to present themselves. And as you can see in the League of Women Voters now, they have a paper form or a candidate a voters guide, but there's not even photo in the guide. Mm -hmm. So I just wonder if we can make a good sense, common sense, make this availability of candidate issues and the social issues. You know, whoever wants to participate to speak, and they can speak. And we can make the whole thing is a certain 
community community wide and so, nationwide make the social issue uh, special justice and fairness. This one is simply almost ignored almost anywhere. Mm -hmm. So so yeah so so communicating across communities is yeah. absolutely essential right. to the health of our democracy. Right. I think this is one area where we need to be leaders and push because we, there are technological tools that make that now a little bit easier than it used to be. But the technology by itself is not going to do it. It needs people to say, okay, we're gonna now provide this in multiple languages, we're gonna provide this by, by you know, using the leg up that the technology provides us with. So for example, I know that Latino Public Radio for the longest time would interview English only, uh, candidates who only spoke English and they would do a simultaneous translation and then rebroadcast their answers. And, and we need to engage in more of that and a recognition that you have to go where people are to help them understand what is being said and, and what their choices are. Yeah, so we have a government that can broadcast almost anywhere. Mm -hmm. You have YouTube anywhere, but we just have to have a government to maintain it, make it easy and cost effective. Yes. Thank you. Thanks. Got one minute. That must be the last question. Who's the introvert? <laughs> All right. Thank you. I'm, I'm Deborah Barry. One of the panelists earlier mentioned um, hurricane victims mm -hmm. and Puerto Ricans coming to the United States and the challenges. Can you talk a little bit about the the challenges they face and state of state election officials and local officials, what challenges they face in terms of taking care of that population and making sure they have Sure, access. sure, sure. Um, well, uh, there are many dimensions to the answer to that question. I'll try to bring it back to our election topic, which is principally is, is that you have a, com a, a, a population of U.S. citizens who are fully entitled to vote, who may not have an understanding of what are those jurisdictional um, structures that they're now a part of. And some of them are coming temporarily, thinking that I just want to wait until things, uh, electricity goes back to my town, things are a little bit better off, I'm going to work here for a little bit and then go back. And so part of the challenge that we as elected officials have is that that person doesn't necessarily find the time and, or interest to really figure out how democracy works here. They're, they'll send their kids to the public schools, but they don't understand that there's a school committee that's setting policy that they actually are, are entitled to, to speak to about what are those needs. Because the structures, the governmental structures in Puerto Rico are different, just like the governmental structures in Georgia are different than those in Louisiana or California. And so that is the, the, the presence of, of Puerto Ricans in the, in the mainland adds that level of complexity. How do we provide civic education to that particular group of US citizens to make sure that they feel that they have that ability to participate during the time that they're here. Um, I would venture to say, though, that the lack of civic uh, uh, you know, knowledge, uh, whatever you do for the Puerto Ricans will be beneficial to everybody else uh, because of what the civics gap that I talk, talked about earlier in my speech. So, but but with, particularly with Puerto Ricans, it's, and I, I face this myself. I mean, how do I communicate with them to let them know while you are here, these are the governmental structures. This is the opportunity you have to make your voices heard. And if you want to criticize or praise whoever it is that is involved in hurricane reconstruction, to be very nonpartisan, um, then there are vehicles to do it within the jurisdiction that you're in right now that you may not have had access to because of Puerto Rico's status.